All right, ladies and gentlemen, starting in on the second video of the unit, uh, we're going to be starting on the fourth page, about a third of the way down, talking about Tsar Alexander II and making our way all the way to the end. Now, I know we've bounced around this unit quite a bit, but at the end of the day, the material is still the material. So if you're looking for anything, go in the order of the study guide. You should be fine. Where are we? Elaborate on the reforms of Tsar Alexander II of Russia. Alexander II is in a tough spot. Russia loses the Crimean War, and it's clear that if they ever want to compete against European powerhouses, they have to stop being known for something other than having a lot of people in cold winters. And so Alexander II is going to start by freeing the serfs, and by doing so, hoping to create a whole bunch of private contractors, individuals who can move around, who can do work, who can demand goods, who can really stir the economy. He also creates the Mir, which is an economic collective. Uh, the goal of those is to try and help the serfs to make their way towards economic self-sufficiency. And the Zemstvo, which are meant to be commentary groups that can feed the Tsar ideas as to what might be going well or not going well, as the case is within Russian society. Unfortunately, this is an enormous society. It's hard for any group to really filter as much information as there is up to the Tsar. Why were some people still upset? No matter what the Tsar did, there were still those who believed that he hadn't done enough. And that includes a group called the People's Will, who in 1881 assassinates the Tsar for not having reformed enough. First reformer in a long time gets whacked. That ain't right. Moving along, the Kulterkampf. Uh, Bismarck's main goal here is to try and create a really hyper-Germanized, I just created a word, Germanized society. We want Germany to be as German as possible. And so that means looking for people who might not have a 100% commitment to Germany and might have a commitment to something else. Like what? Like the religion. A lot of Catholics in Germany. Uh, Bismarck tried to basically eradicate the Catholics. He found out that that Kulturkampf or cultural war was unpopular. He moved on. Next group we're going to hit are the socialists. Now, a socialist is more sinister, Bismarck would tell you, than a Catholic because a socialist really wants to destroy the society. If socialism is to succeed, we have to see the defeat of German society, not just on a capitalist level, but also on a nationalist level. Germany has to be broken down. It has to be destroyed and dismantled in order to become something else, uh, in order to become that socialist utopia, I suppose. And so Bismarck tries to first eliminate socialist groups, uh, curtail their meetings, round up their members, and then he comes across a much smarter plan as we switch to page five. And that plan is to go after the workers in a way that offers them things that the socialists might offer, but to give it to them through the process of peaceful democratic revolution. Uh, I'm going to offer you accident insurance. I'm going to offer you paid time off. I'm going to offer you a vacation and sick uh, uh, days off, if you like. Uh, sorry for studying there. But what I'm really trying to do, if I'm Bismarck, is to try and say to the working people, you don't have to overthrow the system to get a better foothold in it. Let's work this out gradually instead of in a revolutionary way. How did each of the following challenge the Newtonian view of the universe? Well, Newton had proposed and, and society had believed that there was an orderly, rational makeup to the society. And the next couple of pages want to challenge that idea that perhaps reason and rational thought aren't the unlocking decoder keys that we thought that they were. For instance, maybe science isn't as close as we thought it was to being complete. The Curies doing uh, experiments with radium begin to find parts of energy and matter that they can't explain, that are at sort of the subatomic level. That work is followed on by Max Planck. I had a professor in college who said Max Planck. So I would say it that way. Planck's goal is to find the parts of the atom. And what he finds is that energy coming out of the atom is radiated not in a constant stream, but in little packets called quanta. And that they are moving at rates that are not always constant and in amounts that are not always the same. In other words, the universe isn't perfectly rational, perfectly ordered. Ooh. That chips away at the Newtonian idea. We get closer to that with Albert Einstein, whose theories of relativity and also work on time and space and whether those are, are relative begin to make us believe that there is something other than a rational explanation to the universe. Now, continuing on with doubt, we get to individuals who were very radical, like Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche believed that human beings 
were being led astray by modern society, that we were being softened by things like democracy and Christianity and politeness and morality, that really society was restraining the ubermensch, the superman, the individual within the society who was stronger than the pack was being held back by the morals and the limitations of modern society, that those individuals should be allowed to rise above the rest and provide a new set of moral ideals that would redefine the way human beings exist. As I said, Nietzsche is a radical. Freud. Uh, Freud proposes that human beings are not the rational, logical things they appear to be. And the reason for that is that underneath the skin of human beings, inside them, is a battle a subconscious battle that is not rational. It is an irrational clash going on between the various forces within the human being that the id, which is driving and driving and driving for pleasure, is constantly being checked uh, and being controlled and that the result of that check and control is that the human being is not allowed the opportunity to be fully who it wants to be. That society's pressures are pushing on on that are in on that person, that their reason and, and rational drive are also being engaged. And in the long run, we are not what we appear because there is so much else simmering beneath the surface. We talked about impressionist painting, uh, leaders like Monet and Manet. The goal here is to paint things as they feel. Uh, what's the impressionism instead of trying to get the strict realism of them? The post-impressionists uh, use color as well, but the color tends to be more vibrant colors, and it also tends to be more shape-oriented, which transitions us, if you like, from the kind of shapeless, happy place of the, the smudginess of the impressionists through the post-impressionists and into Picasso's cubism. And Picasso's cubism uses geometric shapes and forms in order to give the the images that we see a different reality instead of trying to see things from one perspective and one point of view we are trying to see them from multiple perspectives at one time so geometrically disassembling something and reassembling it by taking apart those parts and putting them back together in a different way uh, does that look something other than beautiful maybe and Picasso would say that perhaps art isn't supposed to be beautiful. Maybe we're not supposed to be working towards this goal of beauty that had been a goal in the past. The Pankhursts are radical feminists who are going to question uh, why women don't have the vote. They're going to use radical tactics like throwing things and chaining themselves to lampposts and hunger strikes in order to get their way. What did each of the following contribute to the debate over Jews in the period? The Dreyfus Affair is... Uh, a case in France where uh, an army captain who was Jewish was suspected of high treason, that he in fact had sold out the French to the Germans during the Franco-Prussian War, and that's why they had lost. Now, what the case really reveals is that there's anti-Semitism rippling through France, that uh, Captain Alfred Dreyfus is not guilty, even though he is initially found guilty and sent to Devil's Island, a prison colony, he is eventually brought back, retried, and exonerated. Theodore Herzl. Herzl would tell you that events like the Dreyfus case make perfect sense. That's how it's going to always be. We have to get out of Europe. That uh, the goal for Jews should be not getting along with European society, but to create their own society out and away from everybody else, a Zionist state in the homeland. On to the seventh and eighth page. Just going to try and get this in under 15 minutes here, folks. Uh, Nicholas II tries to industrialize Russia. He increases railroad tracks, steel production, coal manufacturing. But at the end of the day, it's still Russia. It's a huge country. It doesn't mean Russia is going to be ready for World War I. Causes of the 1905 revolution, the loss to Japan in the 1905 Russo-Japanese War, a lack of food, angry people working in these new industrial centers, a middle class that feels like reform is not coming fast enough. Nicholas has got a lot of problems. Now, when he creates the Duma, uh, the Legislative Assembly in 1905 to try and address those problems, he really is creating a group of middle class advisors who can give him a sense of what's going wrong, but he is not entitled to listen to them, and he doesn't listen to them. In fact, he disbands the group and relies upon military rule. Nicholas is in for some big problems. 
imperialism. One of the big movements of the day is the drive to try and conquer Africa, to take over as much as of, of Africa and Asia as possible. Why? Well, part of it's economic markets, part of it is national prestige, part of it's this idea of the white man's burden, that Europeans have a uh, Hold on, the screen went blank. There we go. Have a requirement where they have to go and try and help people to get as sophisticated as Europeans. Is that a little arrogant, a little Eurocentric? Absolutely it is. That, that was the idea during the time. Now, how did some of these technologies help? Uh, the steamboat helps them to get up rivers in Africa that were previously not navigatable because they were so fierce, so strong in the current. Quinine, or quinine, I beg your pardon, is going to help you to get past malaria, which up until then was just a killer of Europeans. And uh, there should also be on here, oh, the machine gun, there it is at the beginning. The machine gun, if you need to figure out why the machine gun is effective in conquering native people, um, you need to think about that. On the other page, we see native responses, and in both cases, we see natives rebelling against uh, European involvement in the area and attempting to try uh, and get Europeans out of the area. In both cases, unfortunately, what you end up with is a stronger European presence and a stronger European sense of control. Now, the alliance systems. This is really Bismarck at his work. Bismarck wants to try and assure that Germany never fights two fronts. In other words, I don't want a war at the same time with Russia and France. And, if possible, I want to leave the French out in the cold. So the Bismarckian alliance system is set up in a way where the Triple Alliance, that is to say Germany, Austria-Hungary, Italy, is a team, okay? But Germany also has a reinsurance treaty with the Russians. In other words, you don't attack me and I don't attack you. And as long as Bismarck does that, he has nothing to really fear from the English. There's a, there's a fondness, a kinship there. So now, who have we isolated? Russia's our buddy. Austria, Italy, the French are on their own. They don't have anyone to hang out with. We should be fine. Now, in 1890, Bismarck gets fired by the hot-headed William II, or Kaiser Wilhelm II. And when he does that, he makes a couple mistakes. Big mistake number one, he doesn't uh, redo the treaty with Russia. The Russians quickly then jump into an alliance with the French, thus leaving Germany trapped now on two fronts, France on one side, Russia on the other. Eventually, England, fearing the rise of the German Navy, which is another thing that Wilhelm does, is push a huge German Navy. Uh, England, fearing the, the rise of that German Navy, is going to climb in with the French and the Russians as well. So what do we have? We have two big armed camps in Europe. We have the French, the English, the Russians, the Germans, the Austro-Hungarians, and the Italians, lined up and ready to go. Uh, events in Africa are going to heighten tensions as colonial disputes uh, between some of those great powers begin to show the tensions that are going on and within Europe. And the other big problem we have to talk about is the Balkans, where the Serbians are clamoring for not just their own independence and their, their long-time independence, but for more and more territories to be joined to them. Uh, the Serbians have become a real uh, bother, if you will, for the Austro-Hungarians, and they threaten to tip the balance of power. Now, when we get to World War I in the next unit, or is it going to start? Right there in the Balkans. Okay. Hopefully there's some good stuff in these two videos for you folks. Uh, the first video was about 12 minutes long. This one's 13, 25 minutes the whole unit. Study up, folks.